After the Civil War, American industrialization accelerated until by 1890, the United States was rivaling and beginning to surpass Britain in productivity. A generation of industrialists and their sympathizers in law and politics argued that optimal conditions for business benefited the nation as a whole. They shuddered at the rising specter of socialism with its challenge to the legitimacy of capitalism. Andrew Carnegie, the iron and steel magnate, justified his wealth with arguments that borrowed from Darwinian evolutionary theory. At the same time, however, he insisted that the creation of great wealth brought great responsibilities. His gospel of wealth argued that entrepreneurs must now be charitable and paternalistic, distributing their largesse to the less fortunate, in the same way aristocrats had done in former ages. Carnegie was conservative only in a paradoxical way, since his way of life was profoundly innovative. Intellectuals whose family fortunes had been made earlier, meanwhile, shrank in distaste from what to them was the ostentatious vulgarity of Carnegie and the other robber barons. Mocked in their day as mugwumps, they were conservatives of a different stripe, lamenting the eclipse of old republican virtues and looking back nostalgically to the quieter days of their youth. Henry Adams, whose grandfather and great-grandfather had both been presidents, looked even further backwards. In The Education of Henry Adams and Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres, his best-remembered books, he wrote a scathing indictment of industrial society, describing it as inferior to the society of faith that had created the great cathedrals of the Middle Ages. Conservatives in his own day and since have admired his style, but found little or nothing of value in his vision of society. Well, the new industrial giants and their intellectual supporters argued for a political and economic system that maximized their opportunities. Owing more to Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, they were conservatives only insofar as they were trying to forestall socialism. Andrew Carnegie is perhaps the best remembered of them, someone who was active as an industrialist and as a commentator upon it, and he preached the gospel of wealth. His life story is itself fascinating. He was the son of a Scottish handloom weaver. The handloom weavers who'd made fabric by hand for generations had been almost entirely put out of business by the development of, or by the industrialization of the textile business. The handloom weavers were becoming poor. And the Carnegie family, unable to carry on in this way of life in Scotland, emigrated to America when Andrew, their son, was 14. He was extremely ingenious and hardworking, made his way rapidly up until he was in a commanding position in the iron and steel business. In the years after the Civil War, he bought out his competitors and relentlessly updated his equipment. Every time somebody came up with a new invention in the iron and steel business, he'd at once invest in it to make sure that his company was running as efficiently and as, as uh, massively as possible. He also experimented with huge economies of scale, so that he was able to produce higher and higher quality iron and steel at a lower and lower price. He was a hard-driving boss, too. The workmen hated him. He was an anti-union man and a strike-breaker. But he loved America for the opportunities it had given him. In his writing, Carnegie was an outspoken opponent of aristocracy and monarchy, hereditary systems. He had bad memories of his British childhood, of being at the very bottom of a class system which, as he saw it, had excluded him and denied him opportunities. Opportunities of the kind which he had got once he came to America. He agreed with the principle of equality, but to him that meant equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. In fact, Carnegie wrote, inequalities of outcome were benign. He wrote, The conditions of human life have not only been changed, but revolutionized within the past few hundred years. In former days, there was little difference between the dwelling, dress, food and environment of the chief and those of his retainers. The contrast between the palace of the millionaire and the cottage of the labourer, with us today, measures the change which has come with civilization. This change, however, is not to be deplored, but welcomed as highly beneficial. It is well, nay essential, for the progress of the race, that the houses of some should be homes for all that is highest and best in literature and the arts.
and for all the refinements of civilization, rather than that none should be so. Much better this great irregularity than universal squalor. The good old times were not good old times. Neither master nor servant was as well situated then as today. A relapse to old conditions would be disastrous to both, not the least so to him who serves, and would sweep away civilization with it. In other words, Carnegie was entirely unsentimental about the past. He certainly wasn't the kind of conservative to eulogize older eras and took the view that the present was better than the past had ever been. Carnegie also used Darwinian categories to explain and justify his success. Now, in 1859, Charles Darwin, the English biologist, had published his book On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection, and it's one of the two or three most influential books of the entire 19th century. Darwin said, When we look at the natural world and the incredible way in which everything in it seems to fit together, we're not looking at the outcome of God's handiwork, we're looking at the outcome of the struggle of all against all. We're looking at a world of constant predation in which both within species and between species there's an, a, a, a perpetual contest going on for survival. Darwin was writing about biology, but in the later decades of the 19th century, in a wide variety of fields, other writers began to use the Darwinian idea and apply it to other areas of, of human endeavour, particularly to sociology and economics. Carnegie and many uh, social Darwinist economists said, just as there's a struggle in nature, so in the economy. And in, in the economy also, it's the fittest who survive. It's right that they should do so, because they're the people who are making the best commodities for the lowest cost. And they're driving out their competitors who are not so well adapted, again using a Darwinian term, as the ones who succeed. Carnegie tempered these arguments with the... A uh, reminder that possession of great wealth also conferred special responsibilities for enlightened redistribution. And Carnegie wrote, The man who dies rich dies disgraced. He favoured high death taxes to encourage the rich to give away their wealth during their own lifetimes so that they wouldn't become the heads of parasitic dynasties of the kinds which he'd so much resented in his British childhood. And Carnegie himself was a philanthropist on a massive scale. All over the United States and Britain and Canada and Australia, he funded libraries. He was very grateful to a, a man who earlier in his own life had given him access to his books and recognised that access to libraries was itself a great component of civilization uh, and one through which aspiring young men might rise. He gave organs to dozens of churches. He funded universities both in Scotland and in America, as the name Carnegie Mellon might suggest. He founded the Carnegie Foundation. He was an active pacifist in the years leading up to World War I. Another new defender of capitalism was William Graham Sumner. He also offered an intellectual rationale for free market capitalism. And Sumner is an interesting person. He was, he was anti-philosophical, aggressively materialist, and he saw himself as a scientist of e economics uh, and prided himself on his unsentimentality about it. He told a Yale faculty meeting, he was a professor at Yale, he told a Yale faculty meeting when it was considering hiring a new philosophy professor, philosophy is in every way as bad as astrology. It is a complete fake. He said it should be removed from the Yale curriculum as an anachronism. We might just as well have professors of alchemy or fortune-telling or palmistry. He was intent on freeing economics from its old links to Protestant morality and looking at it in cold scientific terms. Sumner had trained as an Episcopal minister in the 1860s, but once he was invited to Yale, his alma mater, to become a professor of political economy, he said he put his faith into a drawer and stopped thinking about it. And when he looked in the drawer again years later, he found it wasn't there anymore. So he made a little joke about the loss of his own Christian faith. Now, in his view, capitalists are the great benefactors of mankind. And civilization, as Sumner defined it, is the accumulated ingenuity of inventors and businessmen over the centuries. He gives this example. If you buy a, a spade, you can farm far more effectively than your ancestors who had to farm with mere sticks. 
but you pay only the price of the spade itself, although the great benefit comes from the invention, although that comes to you free. In other words, it's a free gift from the accumulated heritage of your civilization. Sumner wrote, it is the utmost folly to denounce capital. To do so is to undermine civilization, for capital is the first requisite of every social gain. He's also often described as a social Darwinist, favoring in economics, in the economic world, the war of all against all, as recently explained by, in biology by Darwin, is a close parallel to Carnegie's thinking. And he also gave this intriguing example. He says, if the police rescue a drunk from the gutter, they and the courts and the prison to which the drunk is then taken are all being paid for by, quote, those of us who have resisted vice. He goes on to say, it may shock you to hear me say it, but when you get over the shock, it will do you good to think of it. A drunkard in the gutter is just where he ought to be. Nature is working away at him to get him out of the way. And he goes on to say that society will benefit from the drunk's extinction. Again, he's using a fairly obvious uh, comparison there with the, the member of a species, which in Darwinian terms isn't fit enough to live and will become a victim of some form of predation. He admitted that compassion was okay in families, but it certainly ought not to be the basis of social policy. Sumner was a passionate hater of socialism. He wrote, The old classical civilization fell under an eruption of barbarians from without. It is possible that our new civilization may perish by an explosion from within. And he said, The advocacy of equality is a mistake. Civilization thrives on economic inequality, and it benefits everybody. Well, Sumner was a passionate advocate of capitalism, but he was never a mere flack for the great entrepreneurs, because he condemned tariffs. He spoke out always on what he called the forgotten man. Now, after the Civil War, as America became a more and more powerful industrial nation, the Republican Party, which was mainly in office in those years, favoured high tariffs to protect growing American industries and to protect them against cheap British imports. As we saw last time, Britain by now under Peel had converted to a free trade regime. But Sumner favoured free trade for America as for Britain and he despised tariffs because he said that they politicised the economy and they gave an unearned advantage to the organised manufacturers who were able to lobby in Washington to get high tariffs at the expense of the consumers who now had to pay more. Sumner's view was, if British manufactured goods can come in cheaper than American ones, the Americans ought not to be able to, making them, to be making them until they could do it at the, with the same competitiveness. And Sumner refers frequently to uh, a character called the Forgotten Man. He says, who is the Forgotten Man? He's the clean, quiet, virtuous, domestic citizen who pays his debts and his taxes and is never heard of out of his little circle. Yet who is there in society of a civilised state? who deserves to be remembered and considered by the legislator and statesman before this man. The forgotten man's hard work, his punctuality, sobriety and self-discipline make him the most valuable part of the whole population. Well, this is uh, Sumner singing the praises of what we often call the uh, Protestant work ethic, although, but in an entirely secular format. He's making no appeal here to spiritual values at all, but solely talking about what qualities are good in a citizen. The Mugwumps. The Mugwumps were educated patrician intellectuals. They deplored the rampant corruption of city government and they camp campaigned hard for urban and civic reforms in the 1870s, 80s and 90s. City government was becoming a notoriously corrupt affair in most of the new industrial cities. The most, the most famous example is that of Boss Tweed, who was the head of the New York City government under the rule of Tammany Hall. They were Irish immigrants and their immediate descendants. They dominated the political machine in New York and gradually in many other cities too. The Mugwumps, these old uh, patricians, were uh, appalled by the decline of Republican virtue and they campaigned for civic reform. They raised the question again of whether Democratic majorities should always get what they wanted. Now, because after all, the, these Irish machines often were urban majorities but were ruling in a very corrupt way. 
But the Mugwump's view was that virtue should trump mere majorities. Numbers don't count most, virtue counts most. One of them was George William Curtis, who campaigned for an end to what, what he called the spoils system. According to the spoils system, when a man got uh, one office of mayor, for example, in one of the cities, he handed out jobs to his relatives and friends and family, and also to people who were willing to pay bribes for them. Curtis said, no, what we ought to have in city government is civil service examinations, which are impartially administered, so that the people who are very best able to do the jobs get the jobs. And that the government then in the city should be run entirely without recourse to bribery and special favours. Well, from Curtis's time right up to the present, that's been a constant struggle in American cities to get rid of the temptations of bribery, which are just about universal in urban government. One of his colleagues was E.L. Godkin. He was a crusading journalist, the editor of The Nation. And he campaigned very hard against currency manipulation. In the period between the 1860s and the 1890s, that was a period of prolonged deflation, when the price of many things tended to be going down, even though the population was rising and productivity was rising, because there wasn't enough m money in circulation. And there were various theories about how to increase the supply of money, and in doing so, stimulate inflation. The Greenback movement of the 1870s was one of them, and the free silver movement of the 1880s and 90s was another. But ideas like this horrified Godkin. He said, this is a way of, of political manipulation, which by causing inflation will enable debtors to avoid the full repayment of their debts. He said, in ancient times, adulteration of money or coin clipping was a shameful expedient. It certainly happened, but people were ashamed of it. Quote, that it was a fraudulent device, and that it was a thing, if possible, to be concealed, nobody ever denied. But then he went on to say, now, in the election of 1896, the Democratic candidate, William Jennings Bryan, openly sought the votes of southern and western farmers with a promise of the coinage of free silver, that is, expanding the currency basis from gold to gold and silver. It was an openly avowed policy objective, which seemed downright criminal to Godkin. He wrote, until it is well established that the currency will not come up as a question to be settled by the popular vote at every presidential election, there cannot be any industrial or commercial peace or tranquility. Well, the Mugwumps became advocates of immigrant exclusion, particularly once immigration started to come more and more from southern and eastern Europe, the Slavic countries and Italy and uh, Poland bringing to America people with no experience of Republican government. Curtis, the civil service reformer, wrote, This enormous influx of foreigners has added an immense ignorance and entire unfamiliarity with Republican ideas and habits to the voting class. It has brought other political traditions, other languages and other religious faiths. It has introduced powerful and organized influences not friendly to the Republican principle of freedom of thought and action. After all, if immigrants from Italy or Poland, which weren't democratic, suddenly came to America, became citizens and got the vote, they wouldn't know about this long history of the importance of virtue in a Republican citizen. And in fact, demonstrated by their conduct in the cities that they were willing to cooperate with corrupt systems. In addition to the new defenders of capitalism and the mugwumps, the post-Civil War years also gave rise to an anti-modernist movement whose nostalgic traditionalists eulogized earlier eras in American or European history over against what they saw as the frenzy and bustle and heartlessness of their own industrial society. The two most interesting members of, the, of this group were the Adams brothers, Henry and Brooks. Let me talk about Brooks first. He theorized the cyclical rise and fall of civilizations in such a way as to denigrate his own era and exalt the Middle Ages. He was the grandson of John Quincy Adams and the great-grandson of John Adams, two presidents from earlier in the Republic. In 1895, he published a book called The Law of Civilization and Decay, and it was perhaps the first general theory of history ever attempted by an American. Brooks Adams argued like this, Every age has a characteristic emotion uh, and, and various attributes follow from it. In the medieval era, the dominant emotion was fear. 
But from fear sprang a sense of piety in the face of God and an intense military vigour. And these were the characteristics which made the Middle Ages such an impressive era from his point of view. In particular, they led to the inspiring achievement of the Crusades. And Brooks Adams wrote this. In that age of faith, no such mighty stimulant could inflame the human brain as a march to Jerusalem. A crusade was no vulgar war for a vulgar prize, but an alliance with the supernatural for the conquest of talismans whose possession was tantamount to omnipotence. Pope Urban's words at Claremont when he first preached the Holy War have lost their meaning now, but they burned like fire into the hearts of his listeners then, for he promised them glory on earth and felicity in heaven. So the Crusaders rode out to fight, the originals of the fairy knights, clad in impenetrable armour, mounted on miraculous horses, armed with resistless swords and bearing charmed lives. Well, you can see from that passage that it's a, a florid account. Religious awe, said Brooks Adams, and fear had also led to the building of the great cathedrals of Europe. But later on, the rise of trade and business in Europe displaced piety and fear with a new dominant emotion, the emotion of greed. But, he said, greed's less creative, and in the end it will lead to a reversion to pre-civilised barbarism. In other words, this was a total repudiation of the economist's idea of the benefits of economic self-interest, an idea which was so persuasive to Adam Smith and to Carnegie and to Sumner and many others. Totally different also from Edward Gibbon's idea that it was the peaceful doctrine of Christianity which had led to the downfall of the Roman Empire. Different also from the widely shared 19th century view of progress and steady upward achievement, the belief which Carnegie was expressing in the same years, that the world had never been so good as it was now. Brooks Adams' brother Henry Adams wrote two masterpieces, also on this anti-modernist theme. The first of them was called Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres, written in 1904. In it, he argued the, superior, the superiority of the great northern French cathedrals over any modern structure. Henry Adams travelled very widely, and he loved conveniences like steamships and motor cars. At one point, he even writes that his, his idea of a good day is to ride in a motor car at 30 miles an hour, then a high speed, towards a French cathedral. But he loved the medieval structures best. He shared his brother's view of the supremacy of the Crusades as one of the supreme moments in the history of European civilization. He called them the most interesting event in European history. Never has the Western world shown anything like the energy and unity with which she then flung herself on the East. Well, this wasn't really historically accurate. He implied that the cathedrals were solely uh, constructions to the glory of God, whereas the reality was that they were often monuments to the prince bishops who'd built them. Certainly subsequent generations of medievalists, although they've loved Henry Adams' prose, have said he doesn't really give you an accurate picture of what was happening in the Middle Ages. The Education of Henry Adams, a book he wrote in 1907 but that wasn't published until 1918, lamented what he saw as the decline from grace of his own world in his own lifetime. While the Darwinians were claiming that the world is, is somehow advancing, is evolving, he said, the world's getting steadily worse. And in a, a humorous society, he says, you've only got to compare the US presidents. Look at the first one, George Washington. And look more recently, Ulysses S. Grant, whose presidency had been so unsuccessful. That itself will explode the idea of evolutionary progress. In that book, there's a famous chapter on the Virgin and the Dynamo. He compares the Virgin Mary and the dynamos he saw at the Paris Exposition of 1904. And he, he was impressed by the dynamos. He said, they're powerful and mysterious enough to tempt him almost to worship them. And yet not they, but the Virgin represented the highest energy ever known to man, the creator of four-fifths of his noblest art, exercising vastly more attraction over the human mind than all the steam engines and dynamos ever dreamed of. He was sure that, all the steam in the world could not, like the Virgin, build charge. Other American traditionalists condemned democracy and sought superior past ages to eulogise. Another fascinating one was the practising architect Ralph Adams Cram, surely the best neo-Gothic architect in American history. And he agreed with the Adams brothers about the superiority of medieval styles. He lamented the fact that the Gothic style had been abandoned at the time of the Reformation 
and he sought to, to revivify it and, and make it once more a living tradition. He was an absolutely unashamed elitist. He argued that American architecture had become horrible at just the same time as the rise of Jacksonian democracy. And as far as he was concerned, that was no accident. Now, Ralph Adams Cram did build many beautiful buildings, some of the great buildings in America today. The Cathedral of John the Divine in New York, many of the buildings at West Point, much of Rice University in Texas, and perhaps best of all, his masterpiece, the chapel at Princeton University, and many of the uh, building, the dormitories and the graduate school at Princeton as well, where for several decades he was the chief architect. Cram's view was that buildings served to educate us about the superiority of former ages. Another of these uh, backward-looking uh, traditionalists was Barrett Wendell, a Harvard literature professor. He believed that democracy was going to destroy the precious but fragile substance, the heritage of Western civilization. In his view, democracy brings out the worst in men. It encourages envy and manipulation, not virtue and austerity. Barrett Wendell wrote, Democracy, in old world or in new, seems little better than a caricature of government. Power, wherever it resides, seems bound to develop the hateful traits of human nature. Tyranny, dishonesty, petty baseness, corruption. In a government of the better classes, at least those traits are balanced by certain external graces and dignity, and often by some sense of personal consequence. In any democracy, they are at their worst. Wendell was an intense Anglophile. He loved Queen Victoria and wept openly at the news of her death in 1901. Another interesting phenomenon of the very late 19th and early 20th century was the decision on the part of many wealthy Americans to begin collecting art treasures from Europe. Again, that's, that's a demonstration of their sense that they also belong to a long civilization with a continuous tradition. They began to scour Europe for available treasures, implicitly paying tribute to the superiority of an older civilization. And this was one of the great enthusiasms of the super rich of the late 19th century. Guggenheim, Frick, J.P. Morgan, the basis of many of the great art collections of today, began then. The so-called cottages, actually mansions, at Newport, Rhode Island, were stuffed with treasures from Europe. Several of them hired Bernard Berenson, a Harvard-educated connoisseur, to validate the authenticity of some of the things they were buying. Because, of course, European forgers were quick to start coming up with fake old masters as these American buyers came on the market. One of the most interesting of these new buyers was Isabella Stewart Gardner. She built a Renaissance-style palace in Boston and was among the most conspicuous of all the new collectors. There's a famous portrait of her by the artist John Singer Sargent called Woman and Enigma from 1888. She met Bernard Berenson and she paid for many of his early trips to Europe. His teacher was another of the great old mugwumps, Charles Eliot Norton, professor of Romance languages at Harvard. When Isabella Stuart Gardner inherited a great fortune in 1896, she began to build Fenway Court. She refused to use modern building materials. There was no steel and no concrete. She imported craftsmen from Italy, and she liked the idea of herself as a Renaissance princess. She could be imperious too, perhaps like Catherine de' Medici. Then she could be gentle and compassionate in quick succession. And she laid down in her will a very, very rigorous description of exactly how the palace and its, its contents were to be viewed. So if you go to Fenway Court today in Boston, it's still accessible. You see it very, very close to the way in which she left it at the time of her own death. One more American who found the old European civilization to be superior to the new European one to the new American one, was Henry James, the novelist. He expatriated himself and spent most of his adult life living in Europe. He said, Euro Old Europe offers itself as the place in which great fiction can be written, in the way that raw young America doesn't. America can't yet give rise to a high literary art, because it doesn't have a long medieval past. He was back briefly in America for a visit in 1904, after 20 years continuously in Europe. And Henry James found America jarring, lacking in manners, lacking in deference, constantly in flux. He particularly hated the New York skyscrapers, which were then beginning to rise uh, once architects had worked out how to build high-rise buildings. In Henry James's view, they were monuments solely to capitalism and greed. He wrote, 
They never begin to speak to you in the manner of the builded majesties of the world, as we have, he as we have heretofore known such, with the authority of things of permanence, or even of things of long duration. Worse, they now rose insultingly above the beautiful Gothic spire of Trinity Church, leaving it, said James, caged and dishonoured. Well, these traditionalists, obviously, were a counterpoint to the new enthusiasts for capitalism, a very different manner of conservatism. But, as socialism began to develop, particularly in Europe, conservatives of all types in both countries began to recognise that they had a common heritage which they needed to protect against this new threat.